Hello, welcome to uh, the Retail Bulletin webinar number three. We're just a few seconds uh, before starting, so uh, make yourself that last minute hot drink or pour yourself a glass of water, getting ready for a two o'clock start, bang on the nose, and uh, we will get going with today's panel. Right. It's official, it's two o'clock, so we, we like to start on time here at the Retail Bulletin. Webinar number three, I'll talk about the subject and introduce my panellists in just a moment. My name's Darren, Darren Williams. Uh, I am the founder of a, a business called Williams Harding. Um, in a nutshell, we do interim work, and uh, I am currently, for example, the interim CEO of a skincare brand called Scrubbed, um, a men's skincare brand, British-based, and now in seven markets, and we've just launched in Nordstrom in the US uh, across 60 stores. So um, that's been keeping us very, very busy. Uh, also for my sins, I am the interim ops director of a business called Story, which is a startup brand in the aesthetics world. And uh, it's backed by um, a very well respected group called the Harley Academy. So there are a couple of things that keep me busy. Um, and outside of my day jobs, I do a bit of this. Um, so pre presenting and moderating work for the retail bulletin uh, uh, and others. Um, I've worked with the Retail Bulletin for probably five, six years now as well, and they keep asking me back, so things must be going okay, I guess. Um, welcome to today. As I said, um, I'm Darren. My dog is in the background, Scamp. She's currently asleep, so hopefully we won't be disturbed, um, but you may get some canine activity unexpected at some point, and we'll manage our way through that uh, as and when it happens. She sometimes likes a bit of screen time. I'm going to introduce our panel um, and then we'll talk about how the webinar will flow today. Um, first up, before I introduce the guys on the screen, I just want to uh, add my apologies from a panelist today. Uh, you may have seen someone featured called Cher Lois, who's the, from Well Pharmacy. Uh, she was at rehearsals with us the other day, but unfortunately she is unwell today. So she sends her apologies um, and won't be joining our panel today. However, we do have these two guys um, and we'll keep the air time full and compelling and uh, give you some things to think about hopefully as well. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So first of all, Jeff, if I may start with you, you're to my right on my screen. So um, tell us about you and your business. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff. I'm the CMO for Swift Home. Uh, we're a startup. We launched uh, this year and we sell uh, a range of sofas that uh, uh, come in a box so you can get them through uh, any doorway and up any staircase, but they're they're beautiful looking and they will transform uh, your living space. We're on a we're on a really fast growth curve at the moment. We've um, we've only been going for sort of eleven months, but we're um, yeah we're having a great year. So it's nice to nice to meet you all and talk to you today. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome to the panel. And then Stuart, please tell us about uh, you and your business. Hey, Darren. Thanks a lot for having me, uh, Stu Dorman. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Savio. Um, we are a, a European-wide customer experience technology company uh, focused on, on the customer experience sector. So we help organizations build call centers, you know, optimize the technology that sits in their call centers and make sure we plug that into their digital and online experiences. So my role really is to look after our AI and emerging technology practice within the group. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to the discussion today. Good, thank you. And thank you, I should mention that Sabio is one of the sponsors of the Retail Bulletins webinars today. Um, your website talks about you providing expertise and solutions to respond to the ever-changing needs of customers. So um, it seems like a, a very appropriate sponsor to me, given the subject matters that we're covering on today's webinar. So thanks for your support on that. Thanks also to the Red Eye Group as well. Um, they are trusted by hundreds of businesses with their digital marketing, and they have also um, given their support to the Retail Bulletin's uh, webinar today. So thank you to our to our headline sponsors, one of them on the screen in front of you right now. Okay, so how's it gonna work? So um, I would imagine that we're gonna be running this session for probably the next 40 minutes or so. Um, we'll keep going longer if you need us to. The most important things to us as a panel is that we keep you engaged and interesting and online. Uh, if we see our audience number, number plummeting, then we know that we're doing something wrong and we'll do something controversial. Um, or we'll um, call it a day there. But um, yeah, the most important thing for us is to keep it compelling and that you're interested and that you get something from it. And to that end, I would ask you please to use the Q&A button at the top of the screen. 
Um, the two webinars that we've ran so far this morning have had great audience participation. And so please, absolutely, you're invited to use that Q&A button. Um, and feel free to ask questions in general um, or point them to myself or Jeff or Stuart if you want to specifically ask us um, one of uh, the questions that you may have a burning need to know something. Um, I'll keep the conversation flowing. Um, I will start kicking off with the question uh, with the guys and uh, we'll see how it flows. Um, but yeah, please get the most out of the panel today um, and please do use the Q&A button. The webinar has an exceptionally long title, Emerging Technologies and New CX Possibilities for Engaging with Customers. Take a breath. Um, on a serious note, how uh, the current crisis has really changed everything for all of us and what technology uh, retailers and other businesses can use to meet the emerging engagement challenges is what the subtext talks about. And what are those tools that we can use and what would be the preference of customers and how do you then communicate differently with different segments and different demographics um, and who responds to what? So that's what we're going to try and unpack today. And I'm going to start with you, Jeff, again, nearest box to me. Um, so you've mentioned that you've had a busy year. Um, so good to hear. How have you been best integrating your CX across all of your channels? You know, search to chat, CRM, site personalization, share some, uh, share some diamonds with us. Yeah, sure. So um, we are on the Shopify platform, which lots of startups uh, begin on. And like the Shopify ecosystem is great because you can plug in um, some amazing tools. We use Clavio for, for CRM. Um, we work uh, directly in Shopify for customer services. We can plug in live chat and Shopify does a great job of like tying everything back to an individual customer email address so that you can, you can key through as a, as a, someone on customer service end of things uh, and help that customer by finding out what's happened to them. So like, that's, um, that's a fantastic starting point, but the bit that we've done is kind of tried to go beyond that because, you know, the training and having the notes there and having that single customer view is really important. Um, but what we've been thinking about is taking the same kind of approach we'd take to UX and applying that to customer experience. So trying to work out what the customer problem might be in a given goal, building out those sort of those models of all those different tasks and problems people might have, and then thinking about different solutions and, and testing in and iterating on the design of the customer experience uh, across those platforms. And that's what we're really trying to do. Um, and we're kind of viewing it as something that's sort of never finished. It's something that we've got to keep keep testing. One of the things we have done is we've sort of elevated customer problems um, right up to like the senior management meetings on a Monday morning. Uh, we'll often use a, a five whys approach to like dig in and dig in and dig in to get to the bottom of customer issues. And then our goal is actually, yes, to fix that customer problem as fast as possible, but then start to think about what's the process change that prevents that ever happening again. Um, and like turning that into the culture so that we are um, completely focused on that kind of stuff. That's a big thing for us. And was, it was something that was, it sounds like it was always part of the SWIFT DNA, if you like, but it's just been heightened or really drilled down on since the pandemic started as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, we largely have just lived since the pandemic. We 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 were incorporated properly uh, in March, and so right. uh, we've only interesting timing. Really, oh yeah, absolutely. We've only really existed uh, through it. So it's going to be weird when everything goes back to normal. But um, yes, for us, what we wanted to do was like change things. Our whole our whole mission is to like stop customers having to compromise. That they should have the sofa they want. Um, we offer very fast next day delivery. Um, and like we say, you can get that sofa into any room and, and in, and in and out of any house or up in the staircase. And like, that's our, that's our mission is to take the compromises out of furniture shopping. And for us, the customer experience and like custom services and how the delivery experience should work are all part of that. And we really want that to be, we want that to be perfect for every customer. I'm, I'm, I'm bound to get asked. I'm, I'm thinking it myself. You mentioned the five whys. Help me out. Yeah, so the idea is you, you keep, it's kind of like a lean manufacturing process, actually. So if in, in manufacturing, if, um, if, some, if you had like an error uh, in the production line, um, the idea is you'd get the team back together uh, running that production line, and then you ask five why. So, you know, why, why did that happen? And then when you get the answer to that, it's, the question is, why did that happen? And you keep going five whys in. And we've taken that approach when we're thinking about customer service issues. So a, so a customer complaint will get 
will come up in the week. We'll try and solve that as soon as possible. And then on the Monday morning, when we're looking back on the prior week, we'll use the five whys to drill in to understand you know, what happened. Can we change the can we change the process? Can we can we prevent that ever happening again? That's really our goal. Thank you very much. There we go. We've learned a new uh, a new meeting acronym then, the five whys. I'm gonna be <laughs> afterwards and gonna steal it for myself at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Good, great kickoff, um, Jeff. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, AI mm-hmm. gets chucked to, gets chucked around a lot. Uh, the good old artificial intelligence. I think even the phrase sometimes strikes fear into retailers' hearts, and they don't really quite understand what it is or how they use it. I'm not sure I understand it fully, um, and I think a lot of people feel that way. Mm. How how will AI develop to help customers solve problems? and answer their questions as well, you know, beyond the clunky chatbots that we've become used to and the version of AI we know now? That's, that's a really good question. And I think you're right to say that AI is often quite a daunting subject that people um, don't, don't really get their heads around. They hear it talked about so much in the press from vendors, and often they don't know what it means, or at best they think it relates to, as you say, some kind of simple chatbot experience. And I think for me, AI really, really AI today is, is a triumph of, of pattern recognition. So, um, and often it's underpinned by machine learning, which really is able to take vast amounts of data, analyze that data, look for patterns, and then make predictions on those patterns to, to allow us to do something with, with that information. And there's lots of different ways that we're seeing that applied across the whole customer service sector, but particularly in retail. So one example is um, looking at the patterns of behavior that we all display when we go onto a website and and using that information to understand what type of journey that customer is on, i.e. are they on on a sales journey? Are they looking to buy something? Are they just browsing? Uh, Maybe they're looking for the customer services department to get some help. And it's, it's kind of analogous in some ways to somebody going into a physical retail store when we could, when we could do that. And you know, a really great shop uh, advisor or, or, or helper within the store could look around at any point and they could look at different people's behavior and they could tell well, that person there, they're rifling through a rack to get some, you know, to find a size. Maybe I can step in and help them and, and give them you know, some support. Or this person here is just clearly just browsing on their lunch break. They're not going to buy anything. Or this person here is probably looking around, you know, to find the customer service department. The same principles apply to the website. And we can use machine learning and predictive algorithms driven by AI to to really understand why people, what people are doing on a website. And then we can decide in real time whether we need to step in and help them or whether we just step back and let them carry on you know, their behavior. And that could, stepping in could mean anything from popping a phone number up in a really clear way that they can click on. It could mean we pop a, a simple chat bot. It could mean we pop a web chat or, or the opposite. It could mean that we hold back and we don't present that phone number because that person's actually quite competent and they're gonna carry on and solve their problem on, you know, themselves. And I think that's particularly important now, given the change that we've had over the last few months, because we're seeing a whole new cohort of customers coming online now. We've all heard stories about people that are doing their their supermarket shopping or their shopping online that previously wouldn't have even dreamed of doing that prior to lockdown. So this forced digital behavior has meant that people are going online and maybe they're not quite so certain. So we need to make sure that safety net is there and use that technology to step in and help them if they need to and then make sure that we're able to escalate through to a human in the event that that, that person needs help. So, so that's one area of, of AI. And the second is, is looking at, you know, what you, as you mentioned, looking at um, using speech recognition or natural language recognition technology to act a bit like a concierge and ask somebody why they're calling, whether it be on a chat channel or on a, on a voice channel more commonly now. You know, we've all experienced this through things like Siri and Alexa and Google Home mm-hmm. and stuff like that. We're now able to apply that technology to sit in front of a call center. And that's something that's quite new. That's something that's just happened really over the last 12 to 18 months. The big Silicon Valley players have really democratized that technology. And what it means is we, we can use that to you know, find out what, what the customer is looking to do. It might be simple inquiry like a Wismo, where's my order? Or it could be something more complex. And we can use that to then decide what's the next best action to do. Should we, should we bring that to another human? Should we route it to a specialist department? Should we route it to the store? 
or should we try and solve it you know with one of the digital assets that already exists so that that's another real application of ai that we're seeing really explode at the moment yeah thank you so much i mean there's so much so much in there to unpack i think one of the things about ai and you know and what it represents and you know say for a chatbot function for example if i think about um who people feel it's for. So I think about my my 80 year old stepfather, for example, yeah? So he wouldn't touch any of this with a barge pole. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm still trying to convince him to do his grocery shopping online, Yeah. you know? So he'd still rather shuffle around Tesco with his mask on once a week, which scares the hell out of me rather than use online shopping. So how on earth does AI ever, one, appeal to mm-hmm. the older generation or how does it ever become simple or accessible enough for the older generation to feel it's for them as well yeah it's a it's a great question I, th- I think the way i look at it is if you can imagine that classic technology adoption curve where at the one end you've got your innovators and your early adopters and they're the people probably like me really that would embrace you know a new app comes out we, we're, we're gonna jump on the chance and try and use it and explore it and see how it works at the other end of that tail, you've got your laggards, as they're, as they're called. And no matter what happens, they're probably never going to you know, embrace any form of technology. They'll, they'll revert to their classic behavior. Some of those have been nudged a bit, as I say, through, through the COVID situation, but it, it's gonna be really hard to convince them to embrace those types of technologies. So really what you have to do is to make it completely non-intrusive. You, know, you have to make it so that they don't even have to think about using it. And I think that for me comes down to good design. It's a bit like a website. It's a bit like any, any really you know, application or interface that you design, it has to be simple, it has to be easy to use, and it has to be non-intrusive. And only then really will AI just become a part of the furniture or become you know, part of just, just the process that we use to engage with customers. Yeah, I think you've hit on something there. For me, advances, however they may be, technological lifestyle whatever needs to be almost seamless it needs to happen to us without us all realizing it's happening yeah. and so it becomes part of our life i um i was at orange back in the uh, late 90s and for five years it was just an amazing time in my career and orange was a bit of a trailblazer um mm-hmm. for thinking about the future you know the future's bright the future's orange and so on but we were very future looking and lots of our collateral was future led and one of our recruitment videos we used to play at our assessment centers um, was about the orange house. And yeah. uh, it was looking forward about, 50, it was looking forward to around 2015, funnily enough. You know, and in the 90s, 2015 was almost space age. And like we're doing now, talking on video, conferencing, you know, calling your family on video was featured in that film. And we were all kind of giggling away going, isn't the future going to be crazy? But actually video just suddenly became part of our life and we didn't all go wow it just literally seamlessly happened Mm. and I think therein lies the opportunity for AI is that it needs to feel like it's a seamless benefit that we just adopt rather than something that we're we're scared Mm. of. Jeff what's your view on the older generation stroke AI conversation I think it's an interesting Mm. one to explore more. I think you're right I think it is gonna it's just gonna seep into people's people's lives and like um, I can see my kids, uh, they just run around the kitchen and shout at Alexa when they want to add something to the shopping <laughs> list. It's completely normal. Or if they want to put music on, they'll do the same and they'll stand at the TV and they'll talk to it, expecting it to do something. So, uh, and I think, I think, you know, they're very young, but I think actually for, for older generations as well, over time, it will just become uh, part of the fabric of how things go. I think actually what's, um, what's really important for people who, who uh, are working in customer experience or, or innovation or marketing, whatever it might be, is actually to try some hands-on stuff around AI because I think it can feel so, you know, um, so abstract and, and far away from you and sort of uh, unapproachable that that could, I think it's actually the kind of thing you want to jump in and try. And when I was at Wiggle, we used... Um, we used R a lot, which is a, it's a statistical package for analyzing data. Um, and there's an amazing community of, of developers online who put loads of code up that let you do things. So if you want to do a, a pattern recognition to try and do a prediction of what products might be bought together, for example, the classic, um, the person who looked at this also, also looked at that piece. A lot of these things you can just download for free. 
um, and have a go. And in many ways, that's the best way to have a go because mm. you you break you turn it into a really simple thing, which is kind of you start to think actually, yeah, this is this is a job that in Excel might take me ten weeks, um, but I can get a computer to do this within fifteen minutes of processing. And and that's what we did a lot with the analytics team um, at Wiggle was to try and test out and and try some of these things out. We used um, we used to have a, a, a customer segmentation that was done by a traditional research agency and we paid a lot of money for it and there were kind of eight segments that kind of described the customer base and then we used a free model that we downloaded online uh, which would do a k-means analysis it sounds very fancy but it, what it basically means is it will take every element of the data and compare it to every other element so it'll say is this customer does this customer how much does this customer look like that customer how much does this customer look like that customer and it would and that is the kind of stuff that by hand in excel would take you months to do but the computer yeah. can do that very very fast and then it turned out this hierarchical uh, segmentation of 18 groups of customers and it and it teased out stuff that we've never found through the traditional research and segmentation methods but that stuff was actually stuff that was it was a little bit hacky it was a bit hands-on we got the guys to do it ourselves but everyone walked out of that experience having really got their heads around how ai can help and how it's and everyone was able to go on and dream up other stuff they could do with it so that would be my suggestion to anybody is download a copy of our read some books on it try the stuff out it's it's not uh, crazy mm -hmm. tricky and there's a lot of stuff that you can download for free and reuse i think jeff just to just to pick up on that jeff what, one of the ways that we've um, seen a lot of success of, of companies deploying AI is exactly as you've just described. It's treating it, starting small and treating it organically and growing it based on interactions that customers are having. We've got one of our really successful deployments is for Marks and Spencers. They started in exactly that way with a very small number of intents, which is sort of mapped to the reasons for calling. That's grown to, you know, thousands of different reasons for people calling now. And it sits across all of their 12 million calls that hit their, their business a year. And every single call is answered by an AI, but it, it started small and we grew it organically over time. And, and it's now, you know, hugely helping their performance in terms of getting people through to the right team, improving sales by sort of 10 million pounds a year, something like that. And, uh, yeah. and really I think that approach is, is so important, isn't it? Because otherwise it's just too big to get into. And if you yeah. imagine, you know, you're starting out now as a, as a young marketer or whatever, and you're beginning your career, actually... Um, by the time uh, you get to my age, um, it will be well developed and it will be it will be baked into everything, and you could easily misunderstand how it all works. So yeah, having yeah. a go is a great way. To go. Twelve million calls is a mind-boggling figure when you think about that. By the way, as well, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. It gives us huge amounts of data as well. But but that's what helps us, you know, accelerate the training of the models, etc. But like I say, start small, build it from there, and there's huge amounts of value that can be had by taking that approach and not trying to boil the ocean. I want to stay with the chatbot thing for a bit, if I may. Thank you, guys, by the way. Uh, and by the way, our audience numbers have slightly increased since we've started. So there you go. So we've, we've had some late joiners well, and the, the, origi the originals have stayed with us. So thank you, audience. <laughs> um, we still haven't had any questions from the audience yet, though. So uh, you'd be even better an audience if you throw some questions our way. Um, but staying with the chatbot thing. So um, I tried and failed uh, with a chatbot about a year ago. I was just doing, trying to do an, an upgrade with Vodafone. Um, and actually they pushed the offer to my phone to get the new iPhone, blah, blah, blah. And I, I like the offer, so I thought I'm gonna go for it. So they pushed you into the app and they tried to push the transaction through a chatbot. What they hadn't thought about actually is you need to keep that chatbot connected mm -hmm. to um, complete the transaction. And for some reason it dropped twice 40 minutes into the chatbot conversations each time. So I ended up spending an hour and a half of my life trying to do an upgrade on Vodafone and in the end gave up and went to the shop. Because the second time that I had to start the conversation, I had to start again. Mm. So they have to ask you all the questions again because you're not really with a real person for that whole journey. And it got me thinking that actually from a chatbot point of view, we're five years away yet, aren't we? That um, we're no way near uh, where we need them to be. So if they're that invisible and that ineffective, why bother using them at all at the moment? What are your thoughts on that, guys? Jeff, start with you. Well, I think there are two sides to it. I think there's there's the customer experience side, and my experience is exactly the same as yours, Darren. That's how it feels every single time. It's kind of this uh, slow process where eventually you get bounced to a call centre, um, and while you're on wait on the call center, they're proposing that you listen and read the FAQs on the website. And you can't, you're in this weird loop and it's not a great experience. If you look at it from the other side though, I, we had we turned on live chat on Swift a couple of months ago 
And it totally worked commercially. We turned it on. We had one of our customer service guys. He's happy to, to type away and chat to customers in the evening. Um, and he's able to close sales and he's able to solve problems and all that kind of stuff. So the challenge is commercially, I'm looking at it going, well, that was great. That really worked. We get a great return on investment from it. Our customers love it. Let's do more of it. But actually, and that kind of creates this push where companies want to do these things. And I've worked in bigger companies where you're making all the calculations on the cost savings you'll make by moving uh, conversations over to chat, that kind of stuff. So there's this kind of push that makes you want to do it commercially. But I, I do agree. I think there's still a long way to go to make that a great seamless uh, customer experience. And I think actually, like that, thinking about how people uh, interact now, people are on their phones most of the time. And what you definitely see with like mobile phone data and browsing data is people are coming back in bite sized chunks. They'll browse a bit, they'll go away, they'll do something else, they'll come back into the site, they'll browse a bit. And I think we need to design, and I've never found one, so maybe there's one out there, but I've never seen it. We need to design a chat system that kind of reflects that, that allows yeah. you to like pick conversations back up and it knows who you are, even if that's like a day or two apart, because people are busy and they're doing a thousand things at once. And it's really unusual for you to be able to just sit there for an hour or so and just like focus in on that chat. So I think, you know, even that would make it easier to be able to keep that conversation going over time. That's a good point. Um, Stuart, your view. So I think that um, the way that I think about it is that the, the chatbots really are another user interface that we brought into the mix. So, you know, way back when I remember when I was, when I was younger, it was all about the yellow pages and letting your fingers do the work, <laughs> the way that you reached out to an organization through, through the telephony user interface, um, unless you were obviously physically present. Um, and that was really the birth of the call center industry as we know it. And we had organizations like Direct Line, et cetera, that came about purely based on, on telephony service. Now, that was great in that, you know, you could, you could call a number and get access to an organization. But the telephony user interfaces we knew it back then was was pretty basic, and then obviously we had the web come in with the Google era and Amazon and, and so on. In the probably late nineties, early noughties, that really started to explode. That introduced the graphical user interface as a way of engaging, and obviously we could do so much more with that. You know, we could absorb so much more information and and understand what was going on, um, but maybe not quite so good to resolve complex customer inquiries, where we reverted back to the telephone. That then evolved to sort of mobile user interfaces and touch screens. And really the, 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 the uh, chat bot or the voice bot is, is a conversational user interface. And what you tend to find is that one doesn't replace the other, one complements the other. And I think that's where we are with, with conversational user interfaces right now is that it's complementary both to graphical, to web and to telephony user interfaces. Um, it allows you to understand in more detail what the customer is looking to achieve before taking appropriate action and that appropriate action doesn't always mean carrying that that conversation on through the chatbot quite often it means escalating to a person or maybe even shifting them towards a, the appropriate digital asset that you've got on your website so it's the combination of those user interfaces together for me that that's the right uh, you know the right implicate uh, way of implementing this technology. And it's just, come, again, it comes back to design. It's about using the appropriate user interface based on what the customer is looking to do, what channel they're on, you know, where they are, and, and making sure that it's a joined up experience. And it sounds like Darren, your experience wasn't very joined up, which was, I think, where the problem was. Well, no, you know, the punchline, thank you for that, by the way. You know, the punchline to that experience was um, when I went to the shop, because I lived 10 minutes away from a Vodafone store. So I sort of trudged down there going, I'm gonna get this offer. And showed them the offer on my phone. They're like, sorry, that's an app only offer. So we can't actually honor that in the store. You know, and this is a Vodafone owned retail operation. And they did end up doing it. But yeah. It was a really friction packed experience. But to the point where you almost feel like if I could be bothered with the hassle of porting my number, because I, I, again, I have a perception that's just hassled. Mm. Probably because I remember it in the orange days. And I think things have probably moved on quite a bit since then. But it used to take 28 days to move your number in the old days. Um, mm. It doesn't now. But yeah, so if I just have these perceptions of the friction involved, but again, it's a great example of the arm not talking to the elbow. Yeah. You know, you might have been sent that on, the, on our app, but our stores can't help you with that. And it's just where retailers shoot themselves in the foot. So and and I think that's particularly the case where, with, where, where the digital experience and the human experience intersects and obviously in our world often that that's a, that's the call center but you know it could be anything up to 60 percent of the calls or demand into a call center the customer's been to the app first or they've been online first 
and yeah. then it's a completely disjointed experience you know it's it doesn't need to be but it is because the arms, you know, the, the two parts of the business aren't talking to each other. So there's there's so much more that can be done to join those experiences together and make it flow seamlessly from digital into, into human assistance. And it just baffles me that most organisations aren't taking advantage of that right now. It feels a bit like you can get hold of a business in the old traditional, you know, put, be placed on hold after pressing various numbers on a phone uh, type mm -hmm. way or actually getting through to them by phone is really hard and you have to use some kind of AI, which mm -hmm. is really clunky and doesn't generally work. And so all you end up with in the same scenario is a very frustrated consumer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some work to be done. And I think AI is probably quite far down the list for some retailers because they're still playing catch up on their digital side in general and in terms of even being transactionally better because the pandemic caught them out with the pants down and mm. they were having to find themselves in disaster recovery but in real time mm. so um it's been an interesting experience i think for a lot of retailers and so there'll be a bit of catching up to do for some years to come i would argue we've got two questions in actually they're both from uh, a mark we've got a mark with a k and a mark with a c they're different marks um but i'm going to put the questions for thank you guys um for these questions so, um, and I'll ask both of you actually your, your view. So let's start with Mark with a K. So how do you suggest using, adapting or fine tuning technology or AI to overcome consumer frustration? So for example, encountering lots of out of stock or sold out labels on a website, especially as it's a double-edged sword of showing off stock that you did have or should have versus pissing people off if they're in determined buying mode. So. How, how could that be done better? Um, good, good question. So um, when, um, what I've looked at before uh, when we were at Wiggle was uh, creating segments based on intent. So in, in Google Analytics, we had a, an intent-based score that was calculated by Google as part of the package. You don't have to do anything with that. Um, but you can create audiences from that and using Google Optimize for A-B testing, um, you could test, for example, to your point in that particular example, let's show out, let's not show out of stock products to high intent customers because they look like they're here on a, on a mission to purchase. And let's show out of stocks to the customers who aren't on a high intent journey because we want to show the full range. Because interestingly, actually, on out of stocks, I, in lots of different companies I've worked in online, um, we've A B tested hiding out of stocks, filtering out of stock products. And weirdly, every single time you do that, you lower conversion. So, Overall, uh, the customer base responds better when you show out of stocks, uh, even though it feels like it'd be very frustrating. But what that's so that's where you'd want to go with the AI approach to say, well, there may well be some customers who don't want to see that and try and find those guys. That would be a good place to start. Mm. Stuart, your view on that question? Um, I think just I totally agree with what Jeff was saying. And just building on that, I think it's it's how do you use the AI chatbot, whatever you want to call it, to um, understand in a bit more detail what the customer was actually looking for. So there's, there's obviously you can capture a lot of data from the, the journey the customer takes online, but what happens when they fall off the happy path and something goes wrong? And I think that's where we can use AI to catch that, that interaction, try and figure out what the, was the customer actually looking for, either then suggest another product or escalate to a person uh, and make sure we can you know, deal with that, that issue um, in real time with a human. I think that's exactly where a human ideally would step in and, and help out and, as I say, uh, use the AI to act as the intermediary between the two, but, but use it as a way of capturing data. Yeah, I always think out of stocks are an, inc uh, are, a, are an interesting conundrum, but for me, I've got a really clear view on it. You just don't display them. You don't display them in a store, mm. you don't display them online, and they're exactly the same principle. There's nothing more annoying than showing a customer something they can't have. Um, and I just always thought it was a fundamental principle of retail. And it's interesting that if you are a retailer, you probably take it off the shop floor, but you might leave it on your website instead. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's a funny one. It's a great question, Mark. Actually, I'm going to share another experience with you for 30 seconds. I bought a Dura coffee machine, J-U-R-A, you know, lovely coffee machines. And they've got a showroom on Baker, end of Baker Street, Marlebone Road. So I went to their showroom, you know, thought support the branded retailers in this difficult time saw the one i wanted guess what out of stock and this is after the guy showed me all of its features he was great this it wasn't the salesman's fault but when i said i want this one his heart sank because he's like i haven't got it um and i was like well can i just have this one you know i'll 
buy it off display, not 10% off. No, there's managers like no in the background, no. So I decided to go online and just have a look who might have this coffee machine. And guess what? AO.com had exactly the same machine for 150 pounds cheaper. Um, and so I showed them this and said, I can have this tomorrow if I get it from AO.com. So match the price and sell me the display model and I'll take it away today. No. So I bought it from AO.com and it was delivered the next day. <laughs> and, you know, and I kind of left feeling quite sorry for the salesman because I'd imagine he'd probably get some commission from what he sells. Mm. And he desperately tried to sell me another color of the machine, but I wanted that one. And it was just remarkable to me. It's that kind of whole out of stock thing, uh, lack of agility of physical retail and mm. actually a digital retailer winning my business, one, by undercutting on price and two, giving it to me the next day anyway. Mm. So good question. Um, thank you, Mark, for that. Uh, other Mark, Mark with a C. Uh, he's uh, referring to your point about M&S, Stuart, yeah. um, and M&S using AI. And he says retailers, however, come in many shapes and sizes. So what is the application for AI for an independent retailer on the high street? And you can start with that one, please, Stuart. That's a, that's a really good question. And I think, as I mentioned at the start, AI really today, the, you know, when we talk about AI, we're talking about machine learning. And machine learning is really underpinned by access to data. And therefore, you do need a certain volume of data you know, available to the AI, to the machine learning algorithms to be able to spot those patterns and, and make sense of what's going on and then, and then offer some kind of value back off, off the back of it. So for, a smaller retail, for, for, for small independent retailers, I think um, you know, th there is a certain volume of data that goes through. As I mentioned with Marks and Spencers, you know, they're taking 12 million calls a year. We normally, when we train the models, look to get about 25,000 calls in a minimum for a kind of voice-based um, AI capability. Um, and if you're not getting towards that volume, then it may be that AI is, is not suitable for you as at all to, to apply to your customer experience. That's not to say that you can't use chatbots. Um, a lot of uh, chatbots uh, aren't necessarily using AI. They're using you know, rules-based approaches to understand what you're saying, but then, then respond. So. And, and that kind of technology can be accessible very, very cost effectively now from the cloud. It's really simple to switch this stuff on. It doesn't require huge volumes to go through it. So you can apply simple AI, you know, capabilities like that. But but really, you know, the machine learning stuff that we talked about earlier on for predictive targeting, for dynamic pricing, for, you know, speech recognition and so on requires a larger volume of data, unfortunately. Thanks, Stuart. Jeff, your view? How can the uh, smaller independent retailers use AI better? Um, I think there were, I think the, like I say, like we were saying earlier, I think the thing to do is like jump in and try stuff out um, and read, read some books and some blogs on what other people are doing because you'll come up with some ideas. So for stuff that anyone could try, for example, is there are online tools uh, which will analyze the emotional content of a headline for an email. So if your business is sending out emails to customers, you could put in different, you can, all the ideas you've got for different headlines, you can run them through these tools and get a sense of how motive they are and how likely they are to persuade customers. Um, similarly, you can try all sorts of other stuff with Google Analytics data. So if you're running um, Google Analytics to, to drive traffic, sorry, Google AdWords and, and Google Analytics to drive traffic to your site, um, you, if you download all of your data, you can put those into models in R which will help you calculate like the true uh, value. There's this, there's this model called a Markov model where it will look at the chain, the sequencing of an interaction. So what's the value of an email and a direct visit and an organic visit and a social visit when they're joined together? And what's the value of that when they're done in a different sequence? And these models will calculate a lot of this kind of stuff for yourself. You don't really need to learn how to code. You need to uh, find the code that a lot of people have written about already and they've built models and they're just sharing them publicly. Um, it's still like a really great time for that because people are just excited about what they've built so they want to share it and you can play around with it and like I say it's yeah. the best way to get into it because once you start playing with it it starts becoming a mystery um, and it becomes something you can do and I think it, then when you start to get an idea of what's possible you then look at all parts of the business and kind of say well could, could I do that through machine learning could, could you do this through AI and it, it changes your perspective a bit. It certainly does and Jeff staying with you for a second what would be your golden nugget or your best piece of advice that you could offer the audience around really bridging that gap between digital and human? Um, I think go back to like some customer-centered design principles 
where or UX design principles um, where you you know when you're thinking about building a website same kind of thing you're designing technology that people can interact with so to do that successfully what you've got to do is get yourself in the mind of the customer and whether that's observing people and how they're interacting and so that's listening into calls or observing people trying to connect across a chat bot and then on the telephone and then via the website and then email in and really get a good understanding of what people are doing so you can build up that list of tasks that people are trying and then once you've got each kind of task and you've got a persona for that customer, you know, it might be that task focused person who's looking to get that upgrade on their phone over the chat bar. You can then start to design a user journey that reflects that user. So yeah, going back to old fashioned research principles and then starting from that perspective. Point of view. Thanks Jeff. What's your view on that Stuart? Bridging the gap between digital and human. So I think, um, you know, if I think about sort of, Again, get back to my example earlier on about you know some of the interactions that may take place over the phone when you're speaking to customer uh, to a customer, either for a customer service inquiry or for sales inquiry. Um, what we've started to see, you know, over the last twelve months or so, is the increased use of um, the ability to share content with the customer whilst you're speaking to them on the phone. Um, so it might be that you know, obviously, most customers these days they're near their iPad or they're near a screen of some sort. So the ability to share that in real time, and and um, and that's particularly you know interesting and relevant when you're talking about maybe a complex product or a complex service. You know, in your example about your your mobile phone of, uh, inquiry, for example, imagine if you call in, and often you're given a choice of multiple different tariffs, multiple different devices. Really, really hard for somebody to articulate that over the telephone because of the complexities and the different options there. So imagine if you could share a screen at the same time, much, much like we're doing now, you know, obviously with video, but sharing content, it, it becomes much easier for me to absorb that information and make a more informed decision about the, the product or service that I'm looking to acquire. And there's this, this analogy that I use, it's that we can, you know, we can, um, we can speak faster than we can type, but we can read faster than we can listen. And that just means that we can absorb so much more information with our eyes alongside a voice channel when we're looking to understand, you know, what people are trying to explain to us. And we've seen a massive acceleration of that over the last nine months with video obviously becoming uh, a really important channel. Um, lots of customers in the retail sector looking at ways in which they can actually, you know, transfer a video call and actually start showing the customer the product if it's in a showroom and showing them around the product. So that's really that's been a massive change that we've seen over the last few months and we're seeing you know that, that accelerating as well so layering in video over and above the the ability to share screens and share content thanks Stuart and thank you again to the two marks for their questions as well we've got no other questions coming in and I'm conscious that we're about 45 minutes into this webinar with a smaller panel so I'm going to put a closing question uh, to our panel today and uh, wrap it up and quit while we're ahead because we still held our audience. So our stats are good, guys. So we'll, we'll run away while we've got the chance of staying interesting. But um, share with me. It's a personal view, really. Is there any kind of emerging technology um, or something you've seen in the arena of CX that you think's really going to punch through and it's something that you're particularly excited about, either in something you found in your own businesses or something that you've seen elsewhere? Jeff, wrap it up for me. Well, in terms of customer experience, so we've been working with an amazing startup called Any Place uh, Like, and they are an AR uh, company. So, and they, they're building AR models for our sofas. And like, it's amazing because it really kind of bridges the gap for people, being able to look at one of our products in people's own homes and to turn it around and to change the colors and to try it in a different room and to show your friends and take a picture. It like, that's such a different shopping experience to looking at a small picture on your phone that's an inch or two uh, large. And I think that is going to become, we've seen like fantastic commercial results out of using that technology and people love using it because it really helps them. And I think over time, that's how things are going to move. And I, and I can totally imagine over the next 10 or 15 years that um, an AR type shopping experience the entertainment experience is where we're going to be going because it's so different and uh, uh yeah could be could be very different to how things work now thanks jeff and uh, thank you for appearing on the panel today i i think it's the second panel we've done together so as always thank you for for your time today as well stuart you're the wrap so thank you what's your, what's your view on this uh, what's exciting you out there what have you seen 
Well, first of all, I, I agree with Jeff. You know, I think the AR thing is really exciting and it's, it's, it's really interesting seeing what companies like Apple are doing to lay the foundations of that actually, you know, being, being a mainstream technology in years to come. So I'm, I'm really also really excited about that. In my world, though, there's a couple of areas that we're, we're really starting to focus in on now and, and sort of running some early proof of concepts. But, but really, I think this is going to be quite big as, as the technology you know, matures. Um, firstly, that's looking at using the way we talk about AI, but y- y- applying that to help people um, carry out their jobs on a, on a day to day basis. And in our world, obviously, that's in a call center, but having it listen in to the interaction in real time and make suggestions based on what the customer is saying, and what the, the advisor is saying on things like next best actions or, you know, have you thought about saying this or maybe, you know, there might be a compliance statement if it's a financial service or regulated type of call or summarizing the notes from a call. You know, there, there are many, many applications of using artificial intelligence underpinning the, the conversation between the advisor and the customer. So that's one area that um, I'm quite excited by. The others, um, a bit more simplistic, but we're starting to do some really great work with Google at the moment to embed customer service interactions directly within maps or within search. So one of the things that Google launched just recently was the ability to embed a little uh, messaging widget directly into the search. You've probably seen the kind of telephone numbers that Google will generate today. And what that allows us to do is to go right up to the call to action that the customer takes and start to engage them you know, within search understand using a very simple chat bot as, as to why they're calling what they're looking to do and then helping to escalate them through to the right person or the right location to solve that problem straight away um, again really quite excited by that we're seeing a lot of retailers investigating and, and exploring that at the moment and yeah looking forward to how we can we can embed that into the whole journey and join those join those dots Thank you, Stuart. And uh, some again some compelling points to be made there there's some exciting stuff happening right there is. Uh, Jeff, I've just had one last thing come in, a very quick one. Someone just said, what was your AR company called, please? Oh, No Place Like. There you go. Okay. No Place Like. There you go, Mark. That was the last question. Guys, Jeff, Stuart, thank you so much. Um, uh, A small but beautiful panel, I believe, we've done there. Uh, Webinar number three uh, is complete. Thank you all so much. Webinar number four today is on adapting your 2021 marketing strategy. Who knows what next year has got in store for us? Hopefully it will be a lot calmer than the year we are navigating our way out of. But again, thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Jeff and Stuart. Uh, we've held our audience number again, guys. So thanks for sticking with us to the audience. Thanks to the two marks for the questions. And I wish you all a good rest of your Wednesday. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Cheers all. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.